I just have a few pages here to introduce John. <laughs> it is my sincere privilege and honor to introduce John M. Kravitz, Vice President of Information Technology, Associate CIO of Geisinger Health System in Danville, Pennsylvania, in case anybody was unfamiliar with Geisinger. He's a founding board member of CPA HIMSS and our advocacy chair. He's a member of Blueprint Innovation Summit Advisory Board, member of the American Telemedicine Association, and executive director of KEHI. John holds a Bachelor's of Science jointly in CIS and Business Administration, as well as a Master's of Science degree in Healthcare Administration, both from King's College and Wilkes-Barre. John brings more than 20 years' experience in health care to Geisinger Health System. He has IT executive leadership responsibility, overall merger and acquisition for the Geisinger Health System. I bet that keeps you busy, John. you got other things here, too. He's CIO of Geisinger's Northeast Region, which includes two medical centers and ambulatory practices. In addition to his current responsibilities, he is responsible for the Regional Health Information Exchange, KEHI, which currently connects organizations throughout Pennsylvania. John is responsible for Geisinger's work with Care Connectivity Consortium, a group of little-known healthcare providers that consist of Group Health, Intermountain Health, Kaiser Permanente, and Mayo Clinic, who are developing a service layer to provide optimal functionality to the Healthy Ways Nationwide Health Information Exchange. He also leads the IT support to Geisinger's telehealth programs, which consist of EICU, telestroke, teletrauma, telepsych, telepulmonology, teleecho, and others. In addition to the above, John is responsible for new customer relationships to develop through the outsourcing of physician practices and hospitals using Epic EMR as an ASP service. Prior to joining Geisinger, John was vice president and CIO for Good Shepherd Rehab Network located in Allentown, Allentown Pennsylvania. While at Good Shepherd, he had the technology responsibility for Good Shepherd Penn Partners, a post-acute hospital and ambulatory clinic network through a joint venture with the University of Pennsylvania Health System located in downtown Philadelphia. i got a couple more pages. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take the time... Um, Part of, part of my responsibilities are, are with the CPA HIMSS board, so um, I am the chair for advocacy for Central Pennsylvania HIMSS, uh, but we have a great advocacy network within our state. And so we have just had the uh, IT Advocacy Day last Wednesday down in, in the capital, Harrisburg, had our first uh, virtual advocacy day through HIMSS, and I'd like to recognize some of my colleagues who were very instrumental in a successful day. Um, from <coughs> Delaware Valley Hymns, Joe Miller, Pete McCurry, uh, from Western Pennsylvania Hymns, Robert Chesley, as well as Lee Kim. We had all worked very diligently on advocacy, and Central Pennsylvania Hymns, uh, Edith Dees, Marie Roof, um, Mark, Mark Stevens, uh, Wayne Thompson, as well as Marie, um, Edith, let's see, Edith Dees and Scott McCabe. And uh, Hymns National, we had... Uh, uh, Julie Brown, as well as uh, Tom Keefe, uh, supporting the, uh, the virtual advocacy day for the initiative going forward. So uh, we had a great day, um, reached out to a number of different uh, legislative personnel, both senators and representatives from the state. And uh, I'd like to go over today with you uh, some of the asks and, and really explore why we're looking to do what we're doing and, uh, and really propelling health care forward in the state of Pennsylvania. So just like to start with, you know, what is consumer patient advocacy? And really the definition, it's a political process with an individual or group to influence public, public sector, public policy, really looking to move things forward for the people of our Commonwealth and really taking the time to, uh, to re-engineer political, economic, and social systems in order to make life better. It's a utilitarian approach, make life better for the people and the Commonwealth. So this is what I had just spoken briefly about. We had a session. Um, we had planned for this for months, put an awful lot of work into it, and really had a successful uh, advocacy day. Uh, Nancy Bacheri, who is the, the president of Delaware Valley Hymns, I understood, uh, was our, our leader in this a number of years ago. So we appreciate that. We leveraged a lot of the uh, hard work that you had done for that. And, uh, and it was really a great template for us to follow. So thank you, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> so again, representation from all three Hymns chapters. 
The nice thing about this, we were very collaborative. We worked together on the issues. We became one unified voice for the state, which is, I think, extremely important. Um, you know, CPA HIMSS is about two years old, so we've been working hard to get up to speed with some of the work that DV HIMSS and, and Western Pennsylvania HIMSS have done, and I think now we're, we're starting to walk in step with, with you guys together, so it's good. Uh, we did meet with 12 senators and representatives, and, uh, and I believe we're going to have one of our, our senators, uh, Randy Velakovic, here later on today to talk with us, so uh, very helpful. And again, first Tim's Advocacy Day, um, which is really interesting because we were the last chapter in hymns, and we were the first to have the Advocacy Day, so that's pretty cool, you know, when you look at it from that perspective. So we had really four, four or five legislative asks, and think about it, we're not a lobbying group. We're an educational group. Hymns is there to assist legislative personnel in answering questions before they determine you know, a particular act or a, or a law that they want to put in force and really be a resource for those people. So we want to start with our first ask, which was policies that support telemedicine throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So <clears throat> spending has risen, risen a lot, 40% over the last decade. That's a whole lot of money for healthcare moving forward. Couple that with, as Joe Miller had talked about, the medical assistance population coming in. Uh, I always want to say AmeriHealth Mercy, AmeriHealth. What's the new name? Caritas. Caritas, thank you. And Geisinger Health Plan have been part of that, and there's a third group that's also part of it, with a lot of new medical assistance patients coming in into the managed care ranks. And, you know, you look at this and you say, gosh, we don't want to flood the emergency departments with primary care services. What's a way that we can attack this and really provide the best quality care, the best outcomes for those patients but do it in a controlled environment. So can we do it in a lower level care, as Joe talked about urgent care, or we, we call it convenient care locations in grocery stores with Geisinger. Uh, right now we're at about eight locations. By the end of the year we'll have 26. That's part of our plan to be able to expand those out and provide services. But it's not just having a dock in a box, it's providing services where you can get, through telemedicine, ways to get out to a specialist or to a PCP and not necessarily having to have a PCP in that location. So if you look at it, you can have uh, a physician's assistant, nurse, uh, um, practitioner, thank you, <laughs> I drew a blank on that one, uh, nurse practitioner in those locations, but have access to the primary care physician or to a specialist if you need to via telemedicine. So you, you take the very high cost emergency department visits and drive that cost down, but still provide the highest quality of care for those patients. So we, wanted, we really wanted to have the support of expansion of telemedicine services in the state of Pennsylvania. What a lot of people may not be aware of is effective January 1st of this year, medical assistants had begun paying for telemedicine, two-way video conference telemedicine visits the same as an in-person visit. That's monumental. That's never even been thought of by insurance carriers, but that's the first step. Now we need to start looking at this from the blues and from everybody else, guys in your health plan and everybody, to do the same thing because it makes sense. You're bringing quality care to areas where it might be rural. People have to drive a real long distance to be able to get to those medical centers or hospitals, community hospitals in some cases. So very challenging. So telemedicine can help bridge part of that gap. So we wanted to bring awareness to that, bring it forward, uh, letting the legislative people know that hey, a good thing's been done here for medical assistance. Let's see if we can get some momentum for the other carriers in the state. And that, that all follows with the second sub-bullet, which is talking about the value of reimbursement for telemedicine services. This slide is actually three years old, but I wanted to bring it forward because um, they're stating by, by 2013, 25% of patient encounters in North America, Europe, and Asia will be conducted virtually. That's not necessarily the case, but we're on that pattern, on that path to get there. Um, we're seeing where uh, we expect the growth of telemedicine to be pretty monumental over the next decade to next 25 years. Um, Ed Brown, good friend of ours, uh, University, or I'm sorry, um, Ontario Telehealth Network, uh, president of that, is uh, through that whole province of, of Ontario have expanded the use of telemedicine considerably. And they've seen a great reduction in their cost and quality outcomes have risen. So I think that's a good model. 
that our, our friends to the north have really uh, accentuated and made, made very feasible. So telehealth is, is rapidly evolving. There's a bunch of different areas uh, with telehealth that they could look at. This example over on the left, top left corner, you could see a mobile cart that's really used pretty heavily. We use that at Geisinger for telestroke patients or teleconsultation services. Um, the ability to do teleconsult services, the second from the left, and that is real-time teleconference visits. So consultations, uh, some are just in time, real time. You could be in a, in a PCP office, but need to talk to a rheumatologist or a cardiologist and get them real time with two-way video conferencing. Um, the ability to use mobile type solutions and, and also remote patient monitoring on the far right. So there's a lot of different flavors of telemedicine that can be utilized in our state. And I think it's, it's well, we collectively think it's time that we start thinking outside the box and moving this forward as one of our educational resources for the state. So what are some of the benefits? It certainly improves access to health care, uh, especially if you're in a rural setting where I live. It's all rural. It's uh, Geisinger's one little area in a rural community. But when you think about it, you can go out 100 miles in any direction, and you're just in the woods. So people that live there, the ability to use telemedicine, it does a couple of things. It keeps hospitals sustainable because they can go to a local hospital and get the same level of care and services because telemedicine leverages the expertise back to the major medical centers. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, we have something called EICU. And I see a friend of mine, Ron Cowan, in the room at Lewistown Hospital. We've deployed Telestroke out there. We've deployed EICU. And we actually monitor patients in Ron's hospital. And, uh, and we do it from 70 miles away. Everything comes to a command center. Same process that we followed at Penn when I was down there. And, and it works really well. We've had good outcomes. Uh, patients can stay in Lewistown Hospital. It keeps Lewistown Hospital much more sustainable versus shipping everybody into the medical, medical center location. So that's something to consider. Uh, longer term, it will reduce cost. It's really low barriers to entry to do telemedicine, with the exception of EICU. That's not a low barrier to entry. But, but when you're looking at uh, telestroke or teleconsultation services, remote patient monitoring in the home setting, those are really pretty inexpensive solutions. And it can also help with the shortages of healthcare providers. That's what we've seen with EICU. Uh, Telintensivists or intensivists, uh, people with DO degrees, that really have worked in a very high acuity, high intense uh, healthcare services, they're dwindling. There's a lot less of those folks around. So with use of the command center, we can leverage those people out to multiple hospitals. So we have right now five hospitals connected to our command center. We're going to be adding a sixth in the Northeast uh, within the next year, and then others going forward. So the idea behind this is you can have one doc and a team of, of critical care trained nurses that can treat a patient over 7P to 7A until the re regular physicians come back in the facilities. So that's an example with, uh, with EICU services. So <clears throat> what we're trying to depict here with patient-centered care is there are multiple levels of care where a patient can be seen. Uh, they can be seen in their, in their home setting with video conferencing capabilities. They can be seen in a clinic setting, in a hospital setting, whether it's the main hospital where the services are being hosted from or the community hospital where they're connecting to. Uh, connecting to uh, home health agencies and also long-term care centers. There's other areas with telemedicine that really helps keep long-term care residents who have an episode of care from potentially being transported to an emergency department for services. It's really critical. It happens a lot. Um, the nurses and the, and the administrators for long-term care facilities are very risk averse. So it's very easy for them to pick up a call, transport a patient to an emergency department to be seen and then brought back to the hospital. Where if we have the ability to do telemedicine into the long-term care center, we call it a SNFist or a skilled nursing facility specialist that would actually do those services and potentially keep the patient right there with a nurse practitioner or a PA or even just a head nurse for the nursing home and take them right through the, uh, the assessment, patient assessment visit. So we look at this with placing telemedicine into a context. So 
Telemedicine is, is really the technology itself, but then e-health is what's the process you're gonna treat that patient with telemedicine. So, you know, e-health really talk about portals or access to electronic health records, uh, access to mobile devices, uh, targeting messaging to particular providers, a way to electronically conduct healthcare visits. Uh, and then incor incorporating those two together really is what tele telehealth is all about. So it's the combination of telemedicine with the peripheral devices and equipment and the processes for e-health that becomes telehealth. So those two work congruently. And then just service lines, uh, some of the things that that we do, and I know UPMC and, and Penn and others do, and they do very well. Whoops, fat fingers. Uh, emergency care, so tele ED or telestroke, uh, trauma transfers, that happens a lot. Trauma patients get transferred into med medical centers. Uh, critical care for teleNICU or EICU, those type services. Um, and of course, the consultation services and PCPs with their availability. So. That really, I wanted to give you kind of a background and, and some of the things that we spoke with legislative personnel about concerning telemedicine. That was our first ask. So on to the second ask. This is really uh, the continued support of electronic health records. So if you think about electronic health records, they're great. You know, there's ARA stimulus money for that. How far does it really go? It's acute care hospitals. It's primary care physicians, not specialists. And it is pediatricians or family practice, maternal family medicine, it's part of that. Because it's all part of the, the wellness cycle. That's Obama's platform. It's all about wellness. Keeping people healthy, keep them out of you know, acute care settings as much as possible. But if you think about this, we come up far short. There's something called transitions of care. So people have to go to a skilled nursing center. They have to go to an LTAC, long-term acute care hospital. Long-term acute care hospital is a hospital that's got 25 days or longer length of stays, typically. So people that are chronically acutely ill, they aren't in the very high cost environment of an acute care hospital, they're transitioned over to a, a long-term acute care hospital. There's rehabilitation hospitals for people who have had strokes or orthopedic services or injuries or whatever else, uh, and home health. So you think about these areas, and what's an electronic health record all about? It's about interoperability of data, the ability to exchange data with other people to treat the patient more effectively. And so if we don't have electronic health records in rehabilitation, home health, long-term care, or LTAX, we have a black hole or an abyss. We don't have that connectivity. We don't have the ability to share that information across and treat the patient holistically. So one of the initiatives that we had was to talk with our legislative personnel now, they're not going to make the decision. They're at the state level, but they communicate with the federal people, ONC and other people. They know this is an issue going forward. This was our start with primary care physicians and with, with uh, acute care hospitals to start this process with electronic health records. Now, when we're talking about interoperability as well, we're talking about electronic health records, a Cerner, a Siemens, an Epic, McKesson, whatever it is. They don't all just naturally talk to each other. In fact, they don't talk to each other, period. So we're talking about health information exchanges as well. So an, an HIE takes data, which is supposed to be standard HL7 <coughs> format, and it will massage that data, put it into a format that's communicatable across platforms. Uh, those are some of the inpatient platforms. And you get all scripts, next gen, you name it, MedEnt. Greenway, I was on the phone with Greenway CEO on the way down and we're planning for that, for connectivity. Those are the types of things you need to look at and that's where interoperability really comes into play. You put the EHRs in so you have discrete data that you can share and exchange with people but you need a method to exchange it. Now direct's one method and a lot of EHRs are starting to use direct and they're writing for direct. But think about direct, <coughs> it's point to point. Everything's point to point. Well the world of exchange is not all point to point. The exchange world is find John Kravitz in every place he's been seen and pull me that data in. That's the difference. That's what an HIE does, and that's what HealthyWay is going to do as well. They're right now point to point. HealthyWay is a nationwide health network that connects the VA, connects Social Security Administration, Department of Defense, and 80 other hospital systems. 
it's going to continue to grow. And services like the work that we're doing with the Care Connectivity Consortium, providing a service layer on top of HealthyWay, will be able to collaborate and pull data together and find a place for every one of our 300 million people in this country to be able to isolate and identify the records within seconds and pull that information back. So that's the idea behind interoperability, electronic health records. It's all a building block and a building process to get data to exchange and, and be shared with other people. So I kind of already cover this slide with talking about all the different areas and where we have connectivity and where we're working to get connectivity. But the benefits of an EHR, you know, ready, ready access to information um, puts you in a, in a better position to, to really support accountable care organizations or pay for performance or whatever method is going to be used in the future. Uh, there's a lot of banter in the industry that accountable care organizations are the way of the future. Might be so. Pretty tough to do <laughs> when you look at it. If you don't have a great analytics engine like the gentleman from IBM just talked about before me, you're not going anywhere with an ACO without analytics. Connectivity is one thing, but you need analytics. You have to drive decisions. You have to have a way of reviewing your patient population, knowing who's sick, knowing how to treat them, knowing how to be proactive and get them before they get really sick and get into the hospital. That's the trick to it. And I don't think anybody's really mastered that yet. I think there's a lot of work on the horizon for that. But that's really the direction we're going. And the ability to, to support various metrics. And that's what analytics are all about. Having those metrics, being able to dig in and, and carve up that data and really understand your patient population. And then, you know, God forbid, you get patients that have chronic diseases, which 70% of our healthcare dollar goes to treat patients with chronic disease conditions. That's a lot of $2.7 trillion a year. So where are we? Thanks, Pete McCurry gave me a lot of information on these slides from uh, Quality Insights. Very helpful uh, with the work that they've been doing in supporting uh, the deployment of electronic health records in physicians' practices. So we could see within Pennsylvania compared to the rest of the nation, from the physicians' practice, the whole first subset is all physicians' practices, the lower subset is all acute care hospitals. We're actually uh, lagging behind in the, in the first sector with physicians' practices in Pennsylvania compared to the rest of the nation, but we're ahead slightly in the adoption of EHRs in hospital settings and acute care facilities compared to the rest of the nation. Some of the persistent issues, um, and this, this is primarily, I've seen this in physicians' practice, practices that are putting electronic health records in. Everything from, a, especially if it's a small practice, they're really focused on billing. They have to be. That's their livelihood. That's their sustainability. So their workflows have been primarily focused on making sure they get a good claim out, get the bill out, collect the receivables. Not necessarily the workflows to support the clinical operation for quality outcomes. So that's where people like Quality Insights through the Pennsylvania REACH or REC Regional Extension Centers come into play. So that's really been helpful. Uh, proactive patient care. So, you know, think about patients, you want them to be very much engaged in their health care. <laughs> now, this year, the organization I work for, we're all insured by Geisinger Health Plan, captive audience, so we don't go anywhere else. But uh, the interesting thing was, uh, this is our first year, if your BMI was under 30, if your weight was under a certain uh, threshold, if, you know, blood pressure... Uh, cholesterol screenings, all that stuff, you qualified for 50% reduction in your portion of your health care uh, uh, deductible costs. So that was a great incentive for me. I like to work out anyway. So I thought, well, I'm taking advantage of that. And a lot of other people did. And the nice thing was it didn't exclude. You didn't have to be a thin person. You didn't have to be an active person all the time, but they're trying to change lifestyles. So even if somebody was slightly obese or obese, but they showed trends they're going the right direction, they could take advantage of the same program because they're moving the right direction. They're starting to think quality of life, taking better care of themselves, starting to take the risk factors out of the equation and, and improve their lifestyle. So, you know, we're not the first to do this. We're probably one of the laggards to do it, but, but our organization's doing it now. Next year, my wife has to do it too, so that's pretty cool. You know, <laughs> keep everybody in check. The whole family has to take part of this. 
<laughs> so that's that's part of the uh, the changes. Said that. <laughs> she already knows. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's really it's beneficial because that's really what what the Office of National Coordinator, Dr. Mostashari, really is all about. It's improving the quality of of patients' lives. It's improving their general quality of healthcare, and and really moving the needle, so to speak. Because if we're proactive about this, our overall healthcare costs will go down, but more importantly, the quality of our patients' lives will go up. And that's really the bottom line. So everybody's aware of meaningful use. It's probably a term that everybody's sick of hearing if you're in healthcare, right? So stage one talks about data capturing. And it wasn't a lot of data, data points or data elements, but there were data elements that had to be captured in your electronic health record. And then there's something called leapfrog that tests you to see if you're EHR. We just put an EHR in one of the facilities I'm the CIO at. And uh, it was a grind. It was really a grind, but we got it in. Uh, we did our leapfrog test, and we hit 100%. So we're real happy. We nailed it. And, and now we're into the advanced clinical processes. So stage two. We're already preparing for stage two before we get to that point. And then, of course, stage three will be the improved outcomes, just general, generally speaking. So there, are, there will be new qu clinical quality measures and uh, quality reporting mechanisms in stage two. Uh, payment adjustments and hardships. So uh, adjustments down if you're not meeting meaningful use stage two for hospitals and physicians practice groups. First year it's 1%, then it goes to 2%, then up to 3% reduction in your Medicare payments. That's a real pinch for a physician's practice. Um, so there are solutions out on the market, uh, low cost solutions, which can meet their needs for physicians' practices to get to an EHR or meaningful use. Um, sustainable model. So what does it mean to you? Uh, so if you're in stage one, you have two or three years to be able to uh, provide the meaningful use criteria to go to stage two. Uh, I think stage two, is it 2015? Does anybody remember that date? I don't recall off the top of my head. Martin? Stage two begins October 1 of this year. 2013. But do you have to be for 2014? For 2014. Okay, thank you. Um, so improving patient care, I mean, that's, that's what the, the whole, that's what we're following. That's the ball we're following to improve patient care. So um, through better clinical decision support, as we talked about, the things that the gentleman from IBM just talked about with clinical analytics, data analytics, the stuff they're doing with Watson and natural language processing, a lot of people are doing that. IBM's not the only one doing that stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but, but advanced analytics and data mining, very, very important moving forward. And they are projected to save money. It's going to take time to prove that out. Um, and I think the connectivity, the overall connectivity, will start saving money and saving lives. That's most important. Uh, but there are things, and I, and I want to talk about that a little bit when we get to the HIEs. Uh, really, especially for payers, there's considerable savings for payers if people are connected to the HIE and effectively driving use of the health information exchange to get to data before uh, procedures are reordered specifically radiology procedures. It's dangerous to the patient, exposed to radiation, potential for cancer, a lot of costs for health payers. John, we talk a lot about meaningful use, but we also know that we've got a much larger issue with ICD-10 down yes. the road. What do you see the effect of ICD-10 being from a telemedicine perspective? Because there's a lot of facilities that have, haven't even started to look at ICD-10 and moving forward. And there are facilities like Geisinger and, and Mayo and IHC who are already there, and, and they have the knowledge to maybe help those organizations in, in, in moving forward and understand those code sets. Do you see a correlation anywhere? You know, it's funny when you say that because I, I often think SNOMED would have better, been a better solution to go to ICD-10 or move right to ICD-11. Because ICD-10 just blows ICD-10 way up, big time, with so many details that people have to know precisely, you know, uh, laterality, uh, particular, you know, procedure based upon laterality, and, and all these defined components of that are ICD-10. I got to tell you, we're not there yet at Geisinger, and I know Penn and others aren't there yet. Because everybody had a one-year reprieve, so they took a breath, right? Yeah, we all took a breath, and now we all have to get going again. But it's, it's a challenge, and so many vendors. Yes, buddy? John, bullet number three, not to create a impression for one year, but there's been a lot of studies recently. There's 
their critical section that the bullet number three is, is not playing now. What's your reaction to those? I, I think it's going to take time before it saves money. Yeah, the, the question was um, on bullet number three, you know, there's been some empirical evidence that it may not play out to save money. You know, and it, I think it's going to take time before this plays out to save money with true interoperability and getting vendors like the, the, the Connect vendors that they're talking about. Uh, at HIMSS, they talked McKesson, Allscripts, and four other vendors. Uh, Greenway was part of that. So three other vendors besides those were going to have the ability to completely share information across those platforms. Well, things like that are going to take some time to make it simpler for people to plug in and play, kind of like Microsoft Office, and you slap a CD or a DVD into your, into your computer and it loads up. That's the idea behind the true interoperability, not having to have engineers behind there tweaking and, and making things adjust so they can work and, and connect effectively. There we go. I keep hitting these buttons. I don't even realize I'm touching them. But, but no, buddy, I think you're right. It's going to take time for that to happen. And I think through leveraging things like the HIE, you're going to start seeing uh, savings because duplicative procedures and things of that nature will start to take effect and eliminate those duplicate procedures. And I guess the point there is this other point is, is it the technology or is it the resistance to, resistance to change? Well, yeah, it's part of the workflow change. Yeah, I, I think the technology is more of an enabler, uh, but it's, it's the workflow change, the willingness to change, as you had just mentioned. All those factors are big factors. I know just putting an EHR into a, a 300-bed hospital, it was a real pain in the neck because you're changing process that's everything was paper. And, you know, luckily we had good teams of people to do it, and we knocked it off in like four months, but it was, it was brutal. It was really brutal, and everybody goes through this stuff. It's not, we're not the only ones. So, you know, it's just the challenge of what you're working with. But uh, no, I agree with you on that statement. So, <clears throat> really, in these areas, these are the areas we really wanted to focus on because, you know, behavioral health, home health, long-term care, rehab, LTAX, they really are the area that's more void than others. They, unless... There are very few. There's about 10% of the market really has electronic health records in long-term care centers. You know, the Golden Livings, the, uh, some of the big, big players do have them because they're corporate, 300-plus organizations. They want to roll their data all together and be able to do analytics on their data. So they do have electronic health records. But the, the mom-and-pop long-term care centers or a smaller corporation typically don't have the funding. It's a very low-margin operation. And it's difficult to, uh, to invest in that. So statewide efforts to improve health exchange among these settings are really, really important going forward. And patient engagement. So, you know, we talked about the example with, with Geisinger with the health plan and the employees of Geisinger just getting engaged in their own health, changing their lifestyles, changing their health for a better uh, movement going forward. Well, we need to have patient engagement in a number of different areas. And so use of mobile technologies, patient portals, and connectivity to a health system, or better yet, to a health information exchange, because then you're hitting multiple health systems where you're being, where you're being seen. And you go to one portal and access everything. So really, uh, engagement with those patients, empowered patients, it's extremely important moving forward. Uh, this is from a patient's perspective. Accenture did surveying of, uh, of 1,100 US adults in our country, and, uh, and I think the results are starting to show what we expected they would, and that is um, technology to self-manage healthcare. They, they agree that they would like to have that. They want the ability on their smartphones or in the portals to be able to access this information and really drive their own healthcare going forward. Uh, from the patient's interactions with physicians, they, they want that interaction. They want the ability to electronically interact with physicians. I know we have this through our portal at where I work, uh, through Epic, and it's really uh, very advantageous. It's very fast to get responses. Physicians are looking at it. They are, they're really, they're, in, they're incented to be able to use mobile technology and use it well. So again, patient portal. So, so patient portal can be within your electronic health record, can be within your health information exchange. Um, 
I, I happen to use both, and I prefer the health exchange because, again, if you have a number of members that are part of the health exchange, you're going to get access to that information across the board. Results from hospital A, B, C, your physician's practices, your specialist, whoever is part of that. Even long-term care centers and others, and I could talk about that. So uh, patient engagement for meaningful use, 50% on stage one, and in stage two, it's, it's a requirement or 100% moving forward. And uh, remote monitoring will be part of stage three. So remote patient monitoring, if you think about that, um, and I touched on this briefly under the telemedicine component for the first ask. And remote patient monitoring is, is peripheral devices in the home setting. So say someone who is acutely ill, they have a chronic disease condition, congestive heart failure, for example. Some of you has congestive heart failure. If they start taking on fluids, that's alarming. So they typically have weight scales that are plugged in at home, Bluetooth connected or physically connected to their broadband connection. That goes back into an electronic health record or a health exchange, and it's being monitored by care management nurses. So if you think about that, you step on that scale a couple times a day, and it's doing comparative analysis of what your weight was yesterday at this time to what it is today. If you go up three pounds, that's alarming. You're taking on fluids. you got a big problem here. we got to do something to take corrective action before you end up in the ED. You may get diuretics as a, as a medication. You may have a nurse come to your home. Whatever. But it's, it's, it's an intervention. It's something that can take place that can eliminate you from being back into an inpatient bed for a week or 10 days. A lot of costs associated with that. Quality of life goes down the tubes because you're sitting in a bed. You're not home in your own setting where you'd prefer to be. So now I want to talk about my, my real passion, and that's health exchange. Um, I have the, the very good fortune. When I came to Geisinger about four years ago, um, Key Hire, the Keystone Health Information Exchange, which I didn't know anything about a health exchange. Not one thing. Never, ever touched it before. Uh, but the health exchange had about 10 members at the time. We were doing all documents, no uh, continuity care documents or anything to interoperate or exchange data. Uh, we were very much in our infancy stages. Robert, you, were, you knew Jim a long time, and <laughs> I worked together with this. But I think the difference now with the health exchange and where we're going with health exchanges are really going to move us or support the movement and support the extension of electronic health records considerably. So if you think about it, even in a very electronic health system, you probably still have silos of systems that support each area. And they're great for that application. But if you have a patient that, that traverses from the physician's practice to the hospital to the home health setting, maybe into a nursing home, you don't have an electronic longitudinal record to know where that patient is. Epic doesn't support it. Cerner doesn't support it. Siemens doesn't support it. None of those inpatient systems support it. They're all different vendors. They're all different systems. In some cases, they're electronic health records. In others, they aren't. But, but the idea behind it with the health information exchange is you can connect all those silos of information and share information. There's a master patient index. It's one way to know that Mark Stevens was Mark Stevens in a hospital, in a nursing home, in their home health agency, wherever they've been. We know it's that person because we know all the traits that match, and that is that person. So there's a, a number associated behind the scenes, and that ties all that information together. So part of our ask for number two for the state was consider talking to the federal people that you work with all the time because we want to really move forward in these areas to expand home health, nursing homes, LTACs, uh, other areas, to be able to have interoperability of electronic health records like we have in the acute and moving to in the, in the primary care physician's practices. So <clears throat> the exchange of that information is really paramount for us moving forward. And um, I want to talk a little bit about nursing homes and, and home health and what we could do to help mediate that until we go to electronic health records. So this is key high on what we have so far. We've got 20 hospitals in it, 173 physicians' practices, 28 home health, 70 long-term care centers, and a pharmacy and one LTAC are part of key high right now. And so really to show you all the different levels of care, your primary care physician, external labs, 
there are things like LabQuest or, um, or Quest, LabCore, Geisinger Laboratory Services. We, we have a big, very big lab too. We have the ability to take those results and deliver them to physicians' practice through the health exchange or provide access to that information. Um, all these different levels of care, pharmacy, specialty practices, which are specialists, um, all the way through payers. We, we have a payer connected now, and hopefully we'll bring, be bringing on more payers as time goes by. But the advantage of, of having health exchange, it's got to be transparent, it's got to be trusted, and the information is never analyzed across other organizations. It's data that sits there for the treatment of the patient only. Uh, we have, we have a proven technology. We have Caradyne, but we're moving to Orion Health as our HIE vendor moving forward. And Get Real Health will be our patient portal moving forward as well. So we're, we're in the process of, of changing that out. We'll do it pretty quickly uh, and continue on. But the idea behind it is for us to be able to uh, collect claims data, not just clinical data. Right now, we've been clinically focused. So types of uh, reports we had in the past were history and physicals, discharge summaries, radiology reports, ED summaries, physician summaries from um, ambulatory visits, uh, discrete laboratory results. Those were pre-continuity of care documents. A CCD, which is really, it's a huge document with a bunch of different subsets if you haven't seen one before. And yeah, it's ugly. And so there's the idea behind it, though, is, is discrete data wrapped in XML tags. So you can get at that data and interoperate and share it. So uh, that's really the beauty of a CCD. It's not standard by any stretch. Everybody's different. They're not supposed to be, but they are. So that's part of the challenge. But uh, it really gives you the opportunity to interoperate. And the old method of, a, of using a health exchange was really using a portal, a provider portal, where a physician, a nurse, or someone else clinically can go to it. The new method is really to build into your workflow so you can publish from within your EHR or consume right back in your EHR and no, not going out to a portal. So it's really no more questions for you. I gave you a different list. You're not following it. <laughs> you need a microphone. I don't know where that, there was one right here, it just disappeared. You could talk into my lapel if you want. <laughs> no, go ahead, buddy. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think ACOs will develop their own HIEs, or do you think they will share? Because everything I read is that ACO doesn't have an HIE of some form or fashion. Right. All right, so let me repeat the question for our folks on this side of the room. And that was a good question. And, and really the question is, do you think HCO, ACOs or accountable care organizations will, will utilize a, a, an exchange like Kihai, or do you think they'll develop their own uh, health exchanges? Because if you think of an ACO, it's all disparate levels of care. Even if it's ACOs, which could be four or five community hospitals, they're all on different electronic health records, so they don't all just interoperate with each other. So the idea of having a health exchange to be able to interoperate with one another is, is really a requirement going forward for accountable care organizations. So what's the right answer? Well, the answer is you could have the flexibility to do both. You can provide that as a service, uh, which we would love to do with Kihai. Anybody who wants to start an ACO will be your, your, your delivery of your, your data into your uh, data repository, your analytics engine. Uh, you can do it that way with contracts and uh, agreements that the data would not be mined. It's only delivered connected and delivered. Um, but I think a lot of ACOs, which are in startup mode, will be having their own health exchange <laughs> model, whether it's a DB Motion or a Mobile MD or something like that to connect them. Uh, a lower cost solution. There you go. To, to that point, a quick follow-up question. I'm, I'm curious if the ACOs, in your opinion, if they're going to go with their own private, whether it be you know DB Motion or whatever it may need to be, um, how do you then compete and keep the economic viability of the HIEs going? I know that was one of your asks for advocacies, um, but at some point, um, is there a, a business? Because I've seen, if we can go back to ch Rios and then Chins. Chins. We yeah. can go all the way back, date ourselves in the room. Um, and the financial model has always been the fall down. Right. Generally, how do we keep these up? Because they had the right thing to do. Um, 
So I was curious what, you, what your model is here and the other ones, because you have how many in Pennsylvania? And well, we, I do a lot of work in New York, and they have six just in the city. Right. Well, they have, they have eight throughout the whole state, okay. of New York State, for HIEs. Um, now, New York, New York State, I believe, has done some serious funding of their HIEs to get them up and, and operational and support them to continue to make them sustainable. Uh, you're right. There were, I think, at one point, 173 HIEs and 24 were sustainable. The numbers that I read at one point in time, maybe a year ago. Um, we are on our path to sustainability with Kihai. We actually, um, we do charge our members uh, because we have to pay fees for it as well and support it. Where I think we're going to start seeing a change, and, and we started to crack this nut ourselves last week, was getting health plans who really stand to benefit from this to pay their fair share. And so we just cracked that nut with our own health plan last Friday, which was monumental. That was a celebration for us. Congratulations on that one. Yeah, that was a challenge. So, Robert, I'm coming to see you, buddy. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of work ahead. But seriously, um, health plans are really a, a big area which can really benefit from the use of health exchanges because you can eliminate a lot of the redundancy, a lot of the costs, a lot of the components and expenses that, that you really pay for. And, and it's one way to pull it all together because... Yes, you can get claims data, but it could be late. You know, getting claims data later beyond the same, and you don't have the true clinical data. But in order to do this, we can't just ship stuff out. We have to have agreements with our participants that, that this information would be used by the health plan. So it's, everything is all on the up and up and very transparent. I just wanted to say that for the record. Hi. I, by the way, I'm John Sternley. Most people don't know me, but I'm the CMIO at Holy Redeemer and the physician representative for the newly forming Health Information Exchange in southeastern Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And ACOs are forming in that region. And the reason I think you'll still need an overriding HIE is because the patient migration will not be restricted to one ACO model. Right. So I think that if you, if you follow the patient trail of data, you're going to need an overriding um, HIE solution. That's a good point. Yeah. John? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Go ahead. Raise it up a little bit. The IBM guy, Brendan, made a good point about it's not just an HIT issue we have here. It's a public HIT health information issue we have here. So I guess my question is, let's just take Geisinger. You were mostly in a rural environment play. What are the three major public health IT issues you're wrestling with? Because I'm not hearing you talk about any of that. You're talking about very specific feet on the street issues. We have congestive heart failure, and this is how we're dealing with it. But the real issues might be persistent and you know serious and persistent mental illness. It might be obesity. It might be totally unrelated things that byproduct comorbidity cause the congestive heart failure. What are you doing at the strategic level in looking forward and going down the pike? Well, we're we're doing a couple of things, and that's a good point. I wanted to be more specific so I could relate the technology to the specifics, and that's why I took that approach. But we do have uh, population health. Uh, uh, analytics that we also do as part of this, as well as I'm sure a number of others in the room do the same thing. But looking at the obese population, looking at the Marcellus Shale population, and is that drilling causing contamination of water, which is which is affecting people's health? That's another thing we're working on with Geisinger, and we're doing a lot of research in that area right now. So those are things that we utilize our clinical data analytics for beyond those specifics of CHF, COPD, diabetes, you name it, you know, those chronic disease conditions. So I don't know if I answered your question, you still look like you're not quite connecting. Yeah, Kansas is number one issue. In Kansas, their number one issue was very low birth weight. That's their number one issue in the state, and it's a statewide initiative now. And I'm wondering, because in their geography, in the state of Kansas, that is the, the chronic disease that has the ramifications that go on and on from Medicaid up to as you go on. And I'm wondering, here in Pennsylvania, I'm not hearing anything of that nature where we're looking at the critical issues that are long-term issues. They're not solved necessarily by putting in one system or another, but that well, you attack no. them with the, with the systems you've got. That's what you do. Yeah, but, but obesity is running rampant in rural America. It's running rampant everywhere because people eat at McDonald's. They don't exercise. They don't walk any place anymore. They jump in their car and drive everywhere. So I think these, these analytics engines, if you will, can identify those populations. What are they doing? Well, then you focus on diabetes because that's, that's a byproduct. That's a chronic disease because of obesity. Right. It's typically caused, you have foot issues, you have problems with seeing, your vision. There's a whole bunch of scenarios. Well, 
we utilize our analytics engine to be able to spot those populations of people within our purview or our control. And then we devise treatment plans for those people through our primary care network to be able to support that. And I'm sure they're doing the same thing in Kansas for low birth weight or other places throughout the country that has these issues. But we're, we're trying to use our patient population data to be able to identify and spot trends and, and see the direction you know, people's health is, is moving to try to realign that, if you will. It's, it's a big job. It's a very big job. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Mike, actually, I have a comment and a question, really. Um, actually, I'm working with a bunch of ACOs, and what I see is, like, they are not building their own... Uh, you may want to speak a little louder. They, I'm working with some uh, ACOs, and they're not building their own uh, HIE. They are actually leveraging existing HIEs. Um, but my question is uh, along the lines of Brandon here, um, uh, looking ahead in the future, um, uh, today within the state and within the region, you have the HIEs and the ACOs. What's your take in when we will start to see like crossing the boundaries, the state boundaries, because that should be the end game goal for the HIEs as well as I think ACOs. Well, I think some of the challenges you're going to have when you start crossing state boundaries is consent to share patient information across boundaries. Pennsylvania has three protected, super protected areas where other states do not. They, they're really an opt-out state. If you opt out, then your information is not shared for patient treatment. If you don't opt out, it's, it's, you're following the HIPAA rules and regulations to share that information. So Pennsylvania for HIV, drug and alcohol, and psychotherapy, we have to have consent to share those patient records. And we can't just easily segment that population because they can be seen in a acute care hospital in a psychiatric unit. They can have HIV results show up in a lab result. They could be medications that are used to treat HIV or depression or whatever else. So it's very difficult to screen all that out and put it in its own little pocket and say, we're protecting this, but everything else you could share. That's very, very, very difficult to do. So we're looking at some tools to help us with that, but it's, it's challenging. So the point I'm trying to make is if you're crossing state lines, and so Arizona is an opt-out state, California is an opt-out state, and there's a number of other ones that are, but if you're adjacent to a state where you have to have consent, the consent management policies are a real challenge if you're crossing those lines. It can be done. It's just it's a very, very meticulous process. But to be able to leverage those HIEs for an ACO and and yeah, you don't have state barriers because it's tri-state area, right? New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware or New York, whatever way you look at it, you're still going to treat a patient population with that. So I'm going to continue so I can get through. You got another question somewhere? Go ahead. When you were mentioning the, uh, the continuum care with the silos from the hospitals to the long-term care facilities, has any thought been given to school uh, K through 12 health in terms of tracking school children's nutrition, behavioral health, mental health, in the form of electronic health record? I have to be and honest with you, that. we have not. We have not broached that area as of yet. We're trying to get this under control first. There's an awful lot here to get your arms around. Yeah, there's some pilots going on around the country with, with kids' health as well yeah, with regard to that. We're, we're just not doing, we haven't, we haven't broached that area yet. I think it's a very viable area, and that's your entry point into the healthcare sector, so it makes a lot of sense. I agree with that. It's just an area that we haven't really touched upon yet um, with our, our work at this point. Okay, I'm just going to continue on. These are some of the services, and I, I did talk about this real briefly. So this is a, a portal for providers. This is connecting electronic health records, so you're right within your workflow and you could pull information up from another vendor. That's actually a, a screen that pulls data from a CCD or continuity of care document. And then the HIE for patients, so the patient's portal uh, access into the health information exchange. And then this is our, we call it, we brand it My Key Care. It's a GE Healthcare's patient online system. Um, and it's basically got all the information. We give flu shot reminders to people. They could sign up for stuff. They could upload documents if they have uh, a lot of paperwork because they've had chronic diseases and they travel around the country. They could, they could load all their stuff up and then just get access from any internet connection 
and be able to reference that for the healthcare providers going forward. Uh, they can also exchange secure emails with their team. So everything is protected. It's, it's a HISP service. We provide direct services as well through Kihai and uh, access real-time information from Med Plus, Medline Plus, uh, patient education resources. So it's, it's been well received. And I, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to blow through these couple of slides because it is getting a little late. Um, we also have one other thing for the post-acute care sector. And it's utilized since we don't have electronic health records in 90% of long-term care centers, and probably 75% of home health agencies do not have electronic health records. They're starting to progress to that area, but it's all their expense. There's no stimulus funding for that. Um, we have something that we call LTPAC to a health information exchange. And what that is, is in long-term care, you have a minimum data set uh, patient assessment instrument. And, uh, and that's any time a patient's condition changes or at certain time intervals, they have to have the assessment done. It has to be submitted off to Medicare through Myers and Stauffer. So what we've done was knowing that most long-term care centers do not have a EHR that could produce a CCD, we wrote a tool that actually takes the minimum data set and transforms that into a continuity care document so it could be shared in a standard format within the health information exchange. And so... It, it really allows the MDS paperwork, which is a 37-page document, to be migrated over to a clinical summary and then publishes that information into the health exchange. And we're working on the same thing for OASIS, which is the home health patient assessment instrument at the same time. So we'll have that done very shortly. So uh, it allows us to, to pass the clinical information in a summary format, which is really helpful if a, a long-term care resident ends up going to emergency department and they can look at a clinical summary instead of leafing through all these pages, which no physician wants to do that. Um, they'll look at the, the summary page and that's it. So uh, it's really a, a, it's an effective tool set because we take their data and we make it discrete data that can be exchanged into other acute care systems. The only thing it does not have because it's not collected in the MDS is the medication profile. So we do have a portal for providers. They can update the medications in their CCD as it's generated out of the system and then it's a current complete record to be shared. We use a product called uh, Bridgegate. Uh, if you've ever flown, you see SkyMall in the back of the, the thing in front of you, that's Bridgegate. And that's who we use for dissemination of this. And so that's our product suite offering. So we can actually develop and, uh, and deploy a uh, continuity care document from long-term care. So these other two are very, very brief. Uh, so we want to align privacy and security laws and regulations with requirements for intra and interstate uh, health exchange. So I, I touched upon this real briefly, and that is uh, the consent and the three protected areas in the state of Pennsylvania. Now, Senate Bill 8 was a, a yeoman's effort at this. Uh, but the only problem was it said, yeah, you, it's an opt-out state. We're now an opt-out state with the exception of those three super protected areas. But we really can't control those well enough to, to keep them under wraps. So we're still struggling with this. Um, so talking with uh, Nate Silcox from Senator Randy Velokovich's office, uh, Mark and I had a discussion with him on Friday. Uh, we have some to-dos. We have some work to get him information from other states and background stuff that they could then dig into and look how they've approached this to take this. You know, it's going to be an uphill advocacy fight with patient advocates, no question because they always want to protect this information, but, but really, you know, what's the utilitarian approach? What's the best for everyone? If we have this information, we can share it. We could treat the patients effectively, care for them better and more effectively. Um, I know we have some physicians in the room. I don't know if that's the same approach you would take on that, but we would like to be able to provide you with the data that you need to be able to treat the patients effectively. So <clears throat> that's, that's all part of what HIPAA, you know, designed and Many states have an opt-out policy. We're really an opt-in state, meaning we have to obtain consent because of those three super protected areas. And, uh, and I just talked about Senate Bill 8. So those are the three areas uh, which we discussed. And uh, information can be hidden in a bunch of different places. That's two you've already asked. John, do you see anything in the HIPAA final rules that came out in January that's going to change some of the policies or strategies within the HIEs? 
Buddy, I got to tell you, I've been putting in new systems and I have not, unfortunately, I have not had the chance to go back and review those. I don't know if anybody is an expert in the HIPAA final rules that you could share some information with us. Please, Mark. I'm not an expert, but I'm going to give a plug. Uh, Central Pennsylvania HIMSS is going to put on, uh, thank you, an event uh, this July that we're working on. Uh, and so please, if you're involved with the chapter or if you haven't been, this is your opportunity to do so. We're putting a major event on privacy and security issues and the HIPAA omnibus rule in July. Um, so we're hoping as a chapter to be able to answer those questions statewide. So stay tuned on uh, location and, and date in July. So everybody better start reading ahead of time so we're all well versed in HIPAA rules because it's a challenge. <laughs> so thanks, buddy. That's, I'm 0 for 3 with you today. I just want to acknowledge that. <laughs> <laughs> we're taking your microphone away from you. Um, so discussion with legislators, we're talking about this with them. So again, just doing follow-up with Nate Silcox and Senator Vlakovich, we're going to get some information to them. We hope we could start moving this needle because it really will be beneficial for everyone. We know we're going to hit an uphill battle with patient advocates, but we, we will hopefully use case studies that others have used and been successful in other states. Uh, specifically the ones that come to mind for me are Arizona and California because I, I work with those folks. Mayo has an operation in, in Arizona and Kaiser. They're all up and down California, so I work with those folks every day. So really, really important. And the final one, and I promise this is really brief and we'll be done. We just really want to be an education resource, somebody who they can go to in healthcare when they have questions, when they have things they just don't understand. Come to us, pick up the phone, call us. We we left these asks. We had a, a double-sided one-page sheet, simple, with our contact information on the back with the four asks and, and more explanatory approach to this. But that's really all we want to do is we want to be, we're not a lobby group. We don't intend to lobby. We don't try to force anybody to do anything, but we want to be a resource for uh, the state representatives and, and Senate to be able to move this thing forward. So I think we're all questioned out. I know I am. <laughs> uh, one more question, Pete. Questions that um, Buddy had had pertaining to the quality, cost, and efficiency. Uh, Farzad Montessari uh, had a slide at the uh, HIMSS uh, 13 pertaining to the systematic review of recent studies, the impact of health IT, and uh, as far as outcomes, there were 11 negative studies, 56 positive studies. The quality five negative studies, 57 positive studies, safety, 10 negative studies, 70 positive studies, uh, efficiency, 21 negative studies, and 43 positive studies. So as you can see, sometimes there's an emphasis to look at the uh, bad studies versus all of the good studies that we have pertaining to all of that. Great. Thank you, Pete. It's really helpful. Buddy, you feel satisfied now? Good. <laughs> we just got one more question. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate the time. <laughs>